Many dinosaurs in the Jurassic Park franchise have had some seriously legendary reveals. Whether it be the Tyrannosaur lifting its head up from the opposite side of the electrified fence in the first movie, or the Stegosaurus herd lumbering out of the dense forests of the Lost World, these animals can make some pretty unforgettable entrances. Even without any sort of visual imagery, this series' source material, the two novels by Michael Crichton, offer up a good deal of those reveals as well. One such animal happens to be the subject of today's video. Injun's variation of the Carnotaurus is one of the more favored dinosaurs by fans of the novels. This creature is in possession of an incredibly unique attribute that gives it a nearly perfect camouflage ability. The chromatophores on their bodies helped aid a pair of these animals in blending into the surrounding foliage at night, where they would wait for any unlucky prey to pass by before ambushing and killing it. I've done a video on the famous Carno worker village scene before in the past, where Crichton actually reveals what the animals are to the reader. But long before any of that happened, the Carnos would make their first appearance as soon as Richard Levine made his way to Site B. Our story starts with both Levine and his guy Diego scaling a large cliff. Once they're over the edge, they'll be in John Hammond's rumored lost world. Richard Levine pressed his face to the warm rock cliff before pausing to catch his breath. 500 feet below him, the ocean surged, brilliant thundering waves crashing white against black rocks. Diego looked up to Levine from just below him. Have courage, he said. It isn't far now, senor. You can do it. Levine made his way further up the edge of the cliff. I'm sure I can, he muttered, considering the alternative. At the top, he gave a final heave and thrust himself onto the surface. Levine breathed heavily, tired and weary. While he was still gasping, he looked back and saw Diego come over easily. He squatted on the mossy grass and smiled. Levine turned away and stared at the dense foliage all around him. His legs burned fiercely. But what did that matter? He was finally here. Suddenly a sharp sizzle caught his ears, and he quickly turned behind him to find Diego holding a freshly lit match to a cigarette. Levine immediately sat up and pushed the younger man's hand away. He shook his head no. Diego was confused. He didn't understand Richard's odd concern. He didn't understand what they were up against. After this, Levine unzipped his backpack and began to assemble the Lindstrat air rifle before handing it to Diego. The younger man shrugged, but took it anyway. Now Levine pulled out a small Lindstrat pistol from his holster. He got to his feet and signaled for Diego to follow him. It was time to make their way away from the cliff. Almost immediately, their clothes were soaked from the wet foliage. They moved in darkness on damp mossy earth. The landscape was steep, rugged, and treacherous. At the top of the next ridge, there was a break in the foliage. From this vantage point, they were able to see the far side of the island. Between here and the cliffs, there was nothing but gently undulating jungle. Fantastico, Diego exclaimed. Levine quickly shushed him. But senor, the young man replied, we are alone here. He started to smile. There's nothing but birds here. At that very moment, they heard a deep rumbling sound and soon after a loud unearthly cry. After a moment, this cry was answered from another part of the forest. Diego's eyes widened. To the south, they saw a place where the tops of the trees began to move. A section of forest seemed to come alive before stopping. Diego crossed himself quickly before he followed Levine deeper into the interior of the jungle. It wasn't long until they found the remains of an old jeep trail. Of course, they'd follow it. Their progress would be much quicker on a road. They came across a stream with muddy banks on both sides. Clear three-toed footprints were in the mud, some of them quite large. Something shiny glinted in the stream. Levine bent over to pick it up and realized he was holding a pipette, the kind used in laboratories. Suddenly, he caught movement in his right eye. Something small and brown was scurrying across the ground. Diego saw it too and grunted in surprise. But just as quickly as it had appeared, it had slipped back into the jungle. Levine looked at the tiny footprints left by the animal. He'd seen tracks like this before in a fossilized shoreline in Colorado. He knew what this animal was. Suddenly, a soft squeak came up from his right. The ferns began to shake near him. After waiting patiently, a small animal peeked out from the fronds. It was a musaurus, a tiny prosauropod from the late Triassic. A dinosaur, he thought. The little animal ventured out a bit further from the fronds and slowly, very slowly, Levine extended his hand. The creature squeaked once more, but did not run. If anything, it seemed curious, cocking its head before walking closer. The tiny animal showed no sign of fear before it stepped lightly onto Levine's hand. The little dinosaur walked around and sniffed his fingers. The paleontologist smiled. 
He was charmed. Then suddenly the little creature hissed in annoyance and jumped off of his hand before it disappeared into the fronds. Levine blinked. He didn't understand why. Then he smelled a foul odor and heard heavy rustling in the bushes on the other side. A terrifying high-pitched cry erupted from behind him, and when he turned, he saw that Diego was screaming while his body was being hauled away into the bushes. Diego struggled. The bushes shook ferociously before Levine saw a single large foot pulling back in the fronds with him. They continued to shake. Now the forest erupted in frightening animal roars all around him. He glimpsed a large creature charging him before he turned to run. He felt the adrenaline surge through his body before he realized that he did not know where to go. He felt a heavy weight suddenly tear at his backpack. It forced him to his knees in the mud and he realized in that moment, despite all of his planning and all of his clever deductions, things had gone terribly wrong and he was about to die. The introduction to Site B in Crichton's second novel is one of the least talked about parts of that iconic book. I've always loved the idea of people being catapulted right into danger as soon as they step foot onto Isla Sorna, and this novel does a really good job of painting a picture for the reader to really grasp that. Now, obviously, the animals that killed Diego and attacked Richard Levine were the camouflaging Carnotaurus that we'd later see towards the end of the book. But even before that, Crichton gives us another dinosaur with the introduction of the tiny Musaurus. Nowadays, we know that Musaurus actually grew to be around 10 feet long, but back in the day, it was known as one of the tiniest dinosaurs ever because of the many juvenile bones that paleontologists had unearthed. This is why its name literally translates to mouse lizard. All in all, I am a big fan of the way Crichton introduced these dinosaurs dinosaurs in his novels. In my opinion, scenes like this are what makes Jurassic Park just so damn special. Atmosphere is everything to the lost world, and man do I love it. Now what about all of you guys, what do you think about the first Carnotaurus kill and reveal that was featured in the lost world? Are you a fan of the dark stalking approach, or would you rather have had something a bit more elaborate? Whatever your thoughts are, I'd love to talk about them in the comments down below. Now before I go, I want to thank all of my game wardens, as well as all of my engine executives. I'd also like to thank all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. It really means the world to me that you guys continue to support what I do, and I seriously am extremely thankful for everything that you guys do to help. It honestly means the world. Now I'd like to thank you all for watching this video, and hope that you all enjoy today's content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like, and I hope that you'll consider subscribing if you're interested in hearing from me again. See you on the next video, guys. As always, take it easy.